Good morning. It's 11 o'clock. It's uh, in Honolulu. Uh, I think it's a few hours earlier in Tokyo at Ritsumeikan University. We are joined this morning on Global Connections by Yoichiro, Yoichiro Sato, who's a professor of political science there, and a very old friend, a very old friend of Think Tech. We have known him for probably 10 years, and we appreciate every time we see him. Uh, good morning, Ohio, Yoichiro Sato. Good morning. How are you, Jay? I'm good. I'm good to be with you. So uh, one of the big issues in our time is uh, the, the Chinese moves on the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And that means maritime security. Um, it's going to have, it is having um, a huge effect on, the, on the, the world order, at least in Asia, uh, on trade and on the balance of power. And uh, in general, uh, you know, the, the relative position of China vis-a-vis -vis the other Asian countries and the United States. Uh, so it's very important that we talk about that, and I'm so glad you're here to help us. So you have you have uh, some slides and uh, some thoughts about it, and I'll let you present, um, you know, the situation um, in the what the East China Sea today in maritime security. Okay, thank you, Jay. Uh, yeah, today I'll talk on both East China Sea and South China Sea in some comparison and also a uh, kind of interconnections between mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Well, the international law of the sea uh, defines territorial war, I mean, territorial water, exclusive economic zone and extended continental, continental shelf. So the, the coastal states uh, have a degree of uh, uh, sovereignty over the water. And, but it's not unlimited. Uh, the continent, uh, uh, excuse me, the, Territorial sea is limited to 12 nautical miles from the shoreline, and the exclusive economic zones up to 200 nautical miles. And continental shelf goes beyond up to uh, 350 nautical miles or to the end of the continental shelf. Uh, so uh, when you put it on the actual map, this is the example of Japan and how much uh, sovereign control Japan can uh, exercise according to the international law. And actually, uh, the area size is uh, something like the sixth largest in the world. So uh, the state with long coastal line like Australia, United States, Brazil, Russia, they can claim quite a bit of the ocean. And also surprisingly, France is also uh, up in the rank because of its uh, the colonial island possessions in the South Pacific. So uh, the South China Sea and the East China Sea are both important sea lanes for East Asian countries, Japan, Korea, China, they all import uh, the petroleum resources from the Middle East and also uh, North Africa through the Indian Ocean. And those uh, oil tankers and LNG, the natural gas tankers, they have to come up through the South China Sea after uh, coming from the Indian Ocean side through either the Malacca Strait or the Sunda Strait, Lombok Strait, and going up. Then uh, they have to pass through South China Sea and East China Sea in order to get to their main destinations in China, Korea, or Japan. So as long as those uh, sea lanes are secure, the, the commercial fleets can safely pass through, but it's not only about the commercial uh, vessels, it's also about the, the control of the area by the military. So the naval access to the area is also important, and so is the, the air defense control over those areas. 
The boundaries are, however, not uh, uh, strictly defined by international law because uh, the overlapping claims need to be adjusted by the relevant countries. And here is an example of uh, how Japan, Korea uh, adjusted their continental shelf claims by creating a joint development zone in the overlapping areas. But uh, such negotiations not always successful. And in the case of Japan and China, the claims are overlapping and uh, the adjustment of the claims has not uh, been concluded. But first of all, I want you to take a look at this uh, kind of how the seabed looks like in the East China Sea. And uh, the northwestern part closer to the Chinese continent looks pretty flat. That means uh, the depth there is uh, less than 200 meters. So it's a relatively flat uh, seabed up there. Whereas before reaching to the Okinawan chain of island, there is a deeper uh, uh, the trough, uh, the deeper area, sort of like a valley. And the presence of this valley is a very important factor and also is the location of the Senkaku Island on the edge of that uh, uh, the continental shelf. You can see it in the orange circle. That's where the Senkaku Islands are, which is administratively controlled by Japan. But uh, uh, Japan's claim has been politically challenged by, by China, politically and increasingly uh, physically through uh, sending of, uh, the patrol boats into the area. So China claims the boundary all the way to that uh, Okinawan trough and where Japan's insisting on the, the median line from determined from the Japanese baseline and the Chinese baseline. So the dotted line here is Japan's claim and the green straight line is the Chinese claim and the orange area, quite a large area, is uh, being disputed between Japan and China. Near the boundary, which is claimed by Japan, there are uh, kind of purple squares on the map, and those are the location of the known gas fields. There are some natural gas deposits in the seabed. And China has been uh, drill drilling the areas and pumping gas already. And this became a major political issue back around 2005, already 15 years ago. And after some negotiations uh, in 2008, they agreed on a very limited joint development of one of the field up north. but. Uh, uh, the details about the terms of joint development stored and joint development never materialized. And meanwhile, China continued pumping gas and already uh, from 2008, when they agreed to start discussing the joint development, it's been 12 years already. And most likely the gas will be depleted uh, before anything is agreed. But uh, the problem is Japan cannot uh, utilize the gas effectively. First of all, the gas fields, China built, uh, built the rigs is on the Chinese side of the boundary claimed by Japan. So, Japan cannot do anything about the rigs China built inside, I mean, uh, inside the Chinese uh, side of the line. But the, the chance is that the gas field is spreading across the boundary. And when China pumps it from the Chinese side, 
it's siphoning the gas from the Japanese side as well. So Japan could possibly start pumping from the Japanese side of the boundary. But the problem is, even there, according to the Chinese claim, is well inside the Chinese control line. So if Japan pumps from near the boundary, then uh, there's a possibility that China will intervene. And, and that will likely involve uh, the military forces. So Japan has been hesitating to do that. So uh, here it shows the location of the prospective joint development area up north, but uh, it has not happened. And all these disputes, both East China Sea and South China Sea, are kind of uh, nested in the broader Chinese strategy of the so-called uh, second archipelagic line. Uh, in the medium term, China wants to control the sea inside the second archipelagic line, which will pretty much uh, uh, reach the Ogasawara Bonin Islands, Saipan, Guam, the Marianas, and then go to the southern end of the Philippines, and South China Sea will be completely included in this line. So the Chinese admiral has uh, mentioned in the past during the meeting with uh, US Admiral Keating, and basically China wants to split the Pacific by half, western half, and the Chinese control eastern half, and the the US control and the two superpowers will uh, decide the global power relations. And Japan has some problem with that kind of uh, the Chinese uh, dream. In 2013, uh, I believe it was November, China claimed the air defense identification zone over the East China Sea. And this goes pretty much over China's uh, maritime claim. And US and Japan has not accepted the Chinese uh, demand that the planes flying through this area has to give a prior notification to the Chinese authority. So the US response immediately was to fly uh, B-52 bombers through the, the declared ADIZ of China. And, and since then, the US, Japan both have been flying military uh, flights in this area without uh, informing the Chinese. And China simply cannot stop them. Lately, there is a speculation that China might start declaring uh, ADIZ over the South China Sea, but so far it hasn't happened. And but uh, well, it's pretty clear that China is making preparations uh, for a better air control over the South China Sea. As uh, most of you know, the Chinese are claiming the so-called Nine Dash Line area over the. South China Sea, which includes uh, the Paracel Islands, Bradley Islands, Scarborough Shoal, and you can see uh, if you establish air bases on all those relocations and uh, start uh, deploying fighter planes and so forth, anti-submarine warfare assets, you can control the South China Sea quite effectively. And, and so far, China has uh, built on Paracel Islands, Bradley Islands, but if China start reclaiming Scarborough Shore and start building there, then that's like the, the final stage of uh, reaching such capability. So 
many of those small shores, islands, reefs, they are subjected to this intensifying competition among the littoral countries of the South China Sea. Uh, this year, we have seen a uh, Chinese Coast Guard patrol boat colliding with a Vietnamese fishing boat near the Paracel Islands, and this resulted in the sinking of the Vietnamese fishing boat. The U.S. launched uh, a very strong protest and also responded with uh, the maritime patrol operations, uh, the passage operation, to challenge the, uh, the territorial water uh, control by China. The Chinese fishing boats go all the way to the southern end of the Nine Dash Line to threaten Indonesian controlled water around the Natuna Island. And Indonesia has responded rather strongly by uh, seizing the Chinese fishing boat and, and blowing it up in the sea. So uh, this could develop into a kind of diplomatic food between the two countries. The littoral states, however, not just uh, waiting for China to expand. They are also trying to develop the seabed resources uh, in a joint venture with uh, uh, outside powers. The Vietnam-India joint venture here on, in the orange area. And the recent uh, the case of West Capella, which is a Malaysian Petronas operation, uh, test drilling the water uh, near the Splatry Islands. And the Vietnam's Malaysia joint development area is nearby. And, but uh, for Chinese, it's uh, very much inside the Nine Dash Line. So, uh, so the Chinese naval ships. Uh, and Coast Guard patrol ships came by to check what's going on. And again, US responded by sending its own naval ships together with the Australians and, and even sending uh, the bombers, B-2 bombers from the mainland bases, some 32 hour operation to conduct. So, the tension this year is, is quite high. The literal states negotiate code of conduct and they're supposed to finish the negotiation by 2021, but uh, uh, the coronavirus situation is making the negotiation uh, more difficult. They can only do it on the, uh, the online platform and uh, such platforms are not suitable for sensitive political negotiations like this. So uh, the countries go through joint ventures in disputed water for various reasons, but uh, the economic calculations, political calculations are quite complex matters. So uh, the military control is uh, advancing in the South China Sea, and China has been building, and Chinese activities are by far uh, ahead of others. But uh, lately, the Philippines started uh, developing a little wharf on one of the islands it controls. So others are also responding in kind. China wants to uh, make South China Sea safe for its uh, strategic submarines and uh, deny the U.S. access to the sea. So this military competition is uh, on the bottom line of uh, the dispute over sovereign control and fishing and natural resources. They they are the immediate uh, causes of uh, actual crashes, but uh, the behind that is a legal question, which has a long-term implications for the military control. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Uh, I think my slides are 
finish. Hey, let's let's uh, let's go back to um, our regular format. I uh, really appreciate that, uh, Santosan. Um, is is that China has revealed, um, you know, on a daily basis, an expansionist policy, <clears throat> and it's it's not just in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. It's uh, with respect to all kinds of areas around China. Uh, look at what's happening in Hong Kong. Uh, look at the moves it's trying to make with maybe less success in Taiwan. Um, and so this is all, it seems to me, this is part of a, a larger expansionist plan. Um, and frankly, I think the, the Chinese see the COVID as an opportunity, um, as they are seeing it definitely in Hong Kong. You know, the more, the more Hong Kong uh, is troubled by COVID, the more China seems to move into it. And, and that tells you their state of mind, diplomatically and politically and militarily. <clears throat> so my question to you, and uh, I mean, I'm thinking about this for a long time, is um, are we doing enough? When I say we, I mean the U.S. and Japan. Are we doing enough? It seems like we're doing some things, but they're like tentative things. They're, they're so careful and they mm -hmm. don't want to really provoke the, uh, the dragon. Um, query, can we do more? Do we need to do more in order to contain China's ambitions in this area? Mm. Yeah, the, both the U.S. and Japan have refrained from uh, taking side on the question of which islands belong to which country. And this is actually quite messy. And uh, it, the dispute is not only between China and another Southeast Asian countries. Oftentimes, uh, some of the islands are disputed between South Island, I mean South uh, East Asian countries as well, like be between Philippines and Vietnam, or between Malaysia and the Philippines, and so forth. So uh, this is like can of worms, and <laughs> U.S. doesn't want to stick its heads into that. But, uh, uh, but gradually, the Southeast Asians are sorting out their differences by uh, uh, pretty much following the, the ruling by the, the arbitrary uh, tribunal. And, and uh, that tribunal ruling basically uh, uh, nullifies all of the claims of the exclusive economic zones established around those uh, land features in the South China Sea. So that makes the boundary determination uh, much, much simpler as, as opposed to uh, everybody trying to draw circles around the disputed uh, land features. So if they can do that, then uh, also, the tribunal ruling uh, notified the Chinese nine dash line claim as well. So, China has China's control will be limited to uh, the territorial water around the, the land features it controls. Mm. So, as, I, as I recall, um, you know, Chiril, yeah. um, China, China did not participate in those provision those uh, proceedings. Uh, in, in The Hague, they, they did not uh, agree to abide by uh, the determination made in The Hague. Right. Um, and, and it's a standoff right now. And uh, yes. there's, no, there's no single arbiter in, mm -hmm. the, in the world, the United Nations or The Hague or any tribunal that can say to China, come on, uh, you know, you've got to follow you know, the rules here. Uh, China is a party to the, the Hague Convention, as I recall, but it ignores The Hague result. Yeah, the, there's no enforcement mechanism in many international law, and the, the, the arbitration itself is mandatory. So basically, China has no rights to refuse it, but uh, uh, still, China is refusing it. So uh, how can other countries enforce it? I, I think you really have to go through both uh, kind of legal uh, means as well as uh, the building of defense capabilities. And the U.S. plays the most important role in this. But uh, the well, U.S. Is the U.S. Played, playing a role right now? Is the U.S. playing a role or is the U.S. Uh, falling back on isolationism and distancing itself from the engagement? 
Well, U.S. is trying hard to maintain presence there, but uh, previously, you know, U.S. made certain decisions such as putting B-50 bombers back from Guam to the U.S. mainland. And when the South China Sea tension rose, U.S. Uh, quickly sent the B-1B bombers to Guam on a temporary basis and so forth. So the policy is kind of going back and forth, and, and possibly China is getting a wrong message from that. So the recent uh, the mainland flight, uh, the B- B-1B bombers, uh, was uh, intended to show that the U.S. has a long-range force projection capability. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's not convenient. It, you know, it's uh, different from having... Uh, you know, useful access to air bases in the South China Sea. And the Philippines is actually quite important in that regard. And uh, the Philippines recently uh, announced that uh, it canceled its decision to terminate the visiting force agreement with the United States. So the so next six months, I think two countries will continue to uh, negotiate the possible renewal of uh, U.S. presence in the Philippines. So, you know, sure, is, is there the possibility, I mean, I know force or the, or the um, you know, the projection of force is always important, uh, but it doesn't seem to have had a huge effect. And, you know, if you just uh, look down the pike, look into the future, um, with those tools um, being deployed, it's not clear at all that uh, China will stop or that the U.S. interests or the Japanese interests will be protected. But it just seems to me that, it, it, I ask myself, isn't there a smart power way to do this, uh, short of projecting military force? In other words, uh, China doesn't like to be embarrassed. China doesn't n- like to be made to look like a rogue. It, it likes to project the uh, idea of you know, a, a global, uh, responsible, uh, accountable, you know, that's not true, but accountable power. Um, isn't there a way for um, various countries to get together and create a, a kind of um, multilateral, multilateral group to impose um, some international uh, pressure on China to stop doing this? Well, China has been saying that uh, China will guarantee the safe and free passage of uh, commercial vessels through the South China Sea. But the problem with China, the biggest problem is that China is challenging the the U.S. interpretation of the law of the sea, which basically permits the military intelligence activities in the the exclusive economic zones. So if you divide up the uh, South China Sea among China and the Southeast Asian countries, then some of them, not only China, but some others might also start insisting on the, the ban on military intelligence gathering and maritime research activities by U.S. Navy. And getting a consensus around that among all stakeholders is not likely to happen anytime soon. But going back to the uh, the issue of being um, isolationist and um, you know sort of uh, turning our backs on um, you know the, the risks in this area, uh, I, mean, I thought we were going to pivot uh, into Asia, but I I don't think we're doing that now. Uh, don't you think it would be it's the best interest of of all the non Chinese players here if the U S became more active, um, that it took a more um, you know that it engaged more. And uh, that it uh, that it just it, it got involved. Um, wouldn't that help? Uh, could that help? How could it help? Sure, I think the the U.S. Uh, involvement is necessary to deter China against taking uh, more assertive actions and keeping the the competition in the domain of uh, legal and political negotiations. Because without the U.S. presence, China can more casually resort to forces against the Southeast Asian countries, which will really create a turmoil in the region. But mm. uh, deterring is not 
sufficient. And I think U.S. needs to take a somewhat more proactive approach diplomatically. And currently, the U.S. is active legally I mean, in terms of uh, the legal debate. And especially this year, U.S. started uh, uh, issuing a statement on, for example, Vietnamese fishing boat incident and the, the West Capella incident also. It, they are all accompanied by the immediate uh, U.S. statements uh, having some implications on the legal uh, uh, discussions. So, so that's a good sign. But I think uh, more political, because I don't think laws can solve this issue. Laws are important, but ultimately you have to have a political compromise here. And, and the U.S. needs to uh, assert itself as an important stakeholder, but uh, rather than just confronting, it has to uh, produce a very creative bargain vis-a-vis -vis those multiple players in the region. And mm. we haven't seen that yet. Mm. Well, I'm just, we'll have to leave it there, uh, Santa-san. Uh, it's really been interesting to, uh, to hear your thoughts on this. And I hope we can circle back with you and uh, you know, look at it again in a few weeks or a couple months and, uh, and see how it's changed and how it's changing. Because uh, one thing is clear, it's very complex. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of vagaries um, and, uh, and there's a lot of risks uh, yeah. to everyone involved. Uh, so I hope we can come back and, and talk to you again. Thank you so yeah. much, Sato-san. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. <laughs>